you, if you if you understood the mood of the American art scene at that point, this was totally contrary to it. You know, there was a sense of buoyancy and optimism in this work, and it was all about uh, observing things outside of the self. These were objects from the daily world, from the commercial world, and if if somebody was going to look at objects, why would they look at these unholy things? You know. So it was a total outrage, essentially, in the uh, in the corpus of art of that moment. Well, I remember the first week or two um, working with him, I was absolutely petrified of, as to the way he looked. <laughs> I mean, he was just so strange looking. Everybody warned me not to go near Andy Warhol. I never saw it. I never knew where this image came to begin with. But if you still read anything, any articles or anything about Andy, they all talk about the sex, the drugs, the this, the that. I mean, I don't know where it came from. Of course, there were all those people on the edges hanging around who were completely crazy. But I mean, they weren't as crazy as uh, Reagan and Gorbachev and Colonel North and uh, and Point Dexter. They weren't out raping Central America, you know. They were just having fun. It's an American disease to love famous people, and Andy just shared in that disease. Andy wasn't unique in everything. He was a very good artist, but for the rest, he had, you know, problems like the rest of us. I mean, uh, he, uh, his, big, I mean, that's why he loved wretched people who owned big nightclubs. He loved those entrances. Aka, Midori, Ao, Gunjo Iro, Kirdei. Andy was very aware of death all the time. The term subversive is a very attractive one, but that didn't enter Warhol's mind. He was hardly subversive on any level. He was a participant of anything. He made those things because that's the way he felt he should make them. Yeah.